We were deluding ourselves that the guardrails of this thing called democracy would be enough to moderate and modulate Trumpism. January 6th insurrection is not the end game. It's a sneak preview. It's what I call a rough draft. It's an exhibition game. And they will perfect it and learn from it and do it again. What we're witnessing basically is the death rattle of white supremacy that has turned into a death march, in my opinion. We're up against a very committed, zealous, organized, well-funded, counter-majoritarian minority that is playing for all the marbles. Welcome to episode 71 of the Refuse Fascism podcast. This podcast is brought to you by volunteers with Refuse Fascism. I'm Coco Das, one of those volunteers, guest hosting while your regular host Sam Goldman takes a much needed vacation. Refuse Fascism exposes, analyzes, and stands against the very real danger and threat of fascism coming to power in this country. In today's episode, we are sharing a conversation Sam Goldman had with Wajahat Ali, Daily Beast columnist, public speaker, and author of the memoir, Go Back to Where You Came From. But first, let's talk about some developments from this past week as they relate to the continued fascist threat. This is the week that fascist mouthpiece Tucker Carlson decided to broadcast his increasingly unveiled white supremacist poison from Budapest, Hungary. In his announcement, he said, If you care about Western civilization and democracy and families and the ferocious assault on those things by the leaders of our global institutions, you should know what's happening here right now. So what is happening in Hungary? For one thing, a misogynist, homophobic Christian fanatic named Viktor Orban has largely consolidated fascist rule, telling his country that they must replace liberal democracy in Hungary with Christian democracy, which is actually just a dictatorship with some rights for Christians and everyone else considered subhuman. During his over 10 years in power, he has accomplished things that Trump was on his way to securing before he was voted out of office. Things the American fascist movement, of which Tucker Carlson is a primary driver, is desperate to bring about. Bit by bit, by chipping away at the rules and instituting new rules, such as permit requirements for journalists to report from the border, Orban has remade the legislature the media, and the judiciary into a rubber stamp of his fascist rule. The country is gerrymandered to the point where opposing parties can't win elections. He built a border wall and then sent the bill to the European Union, stating that they should repay Hungary for, quote, protecting all the citizens of Europe from the flood of illegal migrants. His rhetoric constantly demonizes Muslims and refugees, and new laws attempt to associate LGBTQ people with pedophilia. This year, a law went into effect that bans the dissemination of content in schools deemed to promote homosexuality and gender change. Other sweeping changes have been made to the nation's education system that restrict what teachers can teach and promote not based on truth, but on the nationalist and fascist ideology of the ruling party. Sound familiar? And, though it is technically legal, laws restricting abortion access have made it nearly impossible for women to obtain an abortion. Carlson, whose shrill attacks on black people and immigrants and LGBTQ people and scientists and liberals and everybody that Trumpists and this whole fascist movement hates, calls Orban a champion of Christianity. Zach Beauchamp, in an article for Vox in 2018, said this about Orban's rule. Call it soft fascism, a political system that aims to stamp out dissent and seize control of every major aspect of a country's political and social life, without needing to resort to hard measures like banning elections and building up a police state. 
One of the most disconcerting parts of observing Hungarian soft fascism up close is that it's easy to imagine the model being exported. Meanwhile, Arizona continues its audit of the 2020 presidential elections, feeding the big lie that Trump would have won if not for massive voter fraud. This week, an important article appeared in The New Yorker called The Big Money Behind the Big Lie, which details the extreme wealth funding the Arizona audit. It's worth reading in its entirety, but I wanted to highlight this quote by Chad Campbell, a Democrat who was the minority leader in the Arizona House of Representatives until 2014. Campbell said that Arizona is in the midst of a, quote, nonviolent overthrow in some ways. It's subtle and not in people's faces because it's not happening with weapons, but it's still a complete overthrow of democracy. They're trying to disenfranchise everyone who is not older white guys, end quote. But let's be real. We know that this Republic fascist movement is not above using violence. Remember what happened on January 6th? In a talk at Revolution Books this past Wednesday, August 5th, Andy Z, a fellow member of the Refuse Fascism editorial board, said about the January 6th attempted coup at the Capitol, The Republican Fascist Party, their media, and tens of millions of followers are speaking out of three contradictory sides of their large and foul mouths, saying first, it was peaceful. Second, it was really Antifa and Black Lives Matter, with Nancy Pelosi to blame. And third, that it was a just and patriotic event with Ashley Babbitt, a martyr, at the hands of a black Democratic police officer. The key point here, the conclusion to draw from the illogic of these lies, is that January 6th is only a foreshadowing of what's to come. Consider what it would mean if this overthrow, violent or nonviolent, succeeds at any point. What would that mean for humanity if a fascist party with its utter cruelty can cement their rule in the most powerful country in the world? It would truly be an existential nightmare, making it much harder for us to secure any kind of positive future for our youth. The new Refuse Fascism mission statement, which everyone should read and share, says this, that fascism is a qualitative change in how society is governed. Once in power, fascism's defining feature is the essential elimination of the rule of law and democratic and civil rights. The mission statement goes on to say, the Democratic Party will not stop this nightmare. Trump, fascist Fox News, and the Republic Fascist Party have branded them as enemies and traitors. Yet the Democratic Party will consistently pull to try to work with, conciliate with, and collaborate with them. There can be no reconciliation with fascism except on the terms of the fascists. Fascism must be resolutely opposed. What does this paragraph mean, and does it line up with what's actually happening? It doesn't mean that they're all the same, or that the Democratic Party is also a fascist party, or that every opposition they put up is weak or false or meaningless. But the statement says they will pull to work with, conciliate with, and collaborate with them. This was shown to be true once again when Biden explained why he wouldn't support the end of the filibuster, which requires 60 votes for the Senate to pass most legislation, but which many activists are calling for abolishing because it would allow the Democrats to act as a simple majority and enact their agenda, which includes protecting the voting rights that are under vicious assault by Republic fascists across the country. Biden said that ending the filibuster would quote, throw the entire Congress into chaos and nothing will get done. I'm trying to bring the country together, end quote. But uniting this country that is filled with fascists means accepting and compromising with the virulent white supremacy, the oppressive patriarchy and misogyny, the violent and vicious xenophobia, and the all-out assault on truth that these fascists are fighting for with everything they've got. Uniting with this will not defeat fascism. And we cannot keep getting swayed and restrained by the Democratic Party while fascists 
stage their return to the White House, a return that is and will be filled with vengeance. We have to rely on ourselves, building a movement of nonviolent resistance that drives this fascism out of government and society, not for ourselves alone, but for all humanity. With that, let's listen to Sam Goldman's interview with Wajahat Ali. More damning and stark evidence has continued to mount, including in the recent January 6th Select House Committee probe about the lethal white supremacist and Christian fascist nature of the January 6th attack on Congress. One can only honestly call it a coup attempt, failed as it was, the product of month-long work by the Trump regime to overturn Biden's electoral victory. Although the January 6th coup was unsuccessful, leading GOP members continued to legitimize the legal and likely violent seizure of power by the fascists. The Democratic Party continues to fetishize bipartisanship with the party of rapid fascism and white supremacy passage of a quote-unquote bipartisan infrastructure bill, not defeating the fascist forces, not defending voting rights for black and brown people, not protecting the planet, remains Biden's most cherished stated objective. Today, just about seven months post the failed fascist coup attempt, what is the state of the much-proclaimed American democracy? Where are we at in the fascist DEFCON level? How did we get here? And what do we do about that? To get into this, I am thrilled to welcome Wajahat Ali onto the Refuse Fascism podcast. He's a columnist at the Daily Beast and a senior fellow at the Western States Center and Auburn Seminary. You've likely read his work in the New York Times, where he was previously a contributing op-ed writer, or seen him on CNN or elsewhere as a commentator. He is also a recovering attorney and playwright. His forthcoming book, Go Back to Where You Came From, and other helpful recommendations on how to become an American, is available for pre-order now and comes out January 25th. If you're listening to this pod, you already probably follow him on Twitter at Washat Ali. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. That uh, introduction made me sound so awesome. I was like, who is this? this is <laughs> My wife was probably like, I want to marry him. <laughs> Very kind of you. Well, kind but true. So let's start really light with the definition of fascism that Refuse Fascism uses. And we define it as not just a gross combination of horrific reactionary policies, but a qualitative change in how society is governed. That Mm -hmm. once in power, fascism's determining feature is the essential elimination of the rule of law and democratic and civil rights. That it foments and relies on xenophobia, nationalism, racism, misogyny, and the aggressive reinstitution of quote unquote traditional values. Truth is obliterated and fascist mobs and threat of threats of violence are unleashed to build their movement and consolidate power. Let's start with what do you see as the current fascist DEFCON level? I would say I appreciate your use of DEFCON because I usually use that and people are like, what are you talking about? And people oftentimes think that DEFCON 5 is the worst. But actually, and maybe your listeners know this, DEFCON 5 out of the five stages of DEFCON, DEFCON 5 is pretty good. It's blue. And one is cocked pistol, right? It's game time. It's on. So I would put us at three which I think is yellow. And it means like the Air Force is ready to go at a moment's notice, like at 15, 20 minutes notice. So I would put us at three. And first and foremost, I'm sure you've had many interview subjects who've come on and said, you know, we've been saying this for a while and we weren't taken seriously by many of our colleagues. People of color in particular have been saying this for a while. Scholars of authoritarianism, scholars of fascism, especially as took place in Europe. Sober folks like Timothy Snyder, the authors of How Democracies Die, you know, Anne Applebaum, who's been a conservative for most of her life. When these individuals are writing books, warning Americans like we are at a threshold right now, then you have individuals in polite society, in what we call mainstream society, and what we call power circles. And I've had a foot in that, thanks to the introduction that you read, who then take it seriously. They've often ignored the rest of us. And for the rest of us, Trump's administration resistance to us, especially people of color, Muslims, undocumented immigrants, you know, resistance to us was surviving. Resistance to us was walking outside of the home with our head held up high, having a smile on our face and telling our children that this country belongs to you, even though the president of the United States is implementing a Muslim ban and putting kids in cages. And so for me, I have always thought that the Trump administration, and hopefully I have the receipts to back it up with my tweets and my CNN appearances and my articles, I've thought that this is a counter-majoritarian authoritarian movement, fascism light at the time, that if given enough rope, will slaughter democracy for the sake of power. And 
enough people, even a year and a half ago, when I tweeted this, I said, you know, what makes you think Trump will leave? If you go look at the receipts, people are like, Wajad, you're being so hysterical. You're being reactionary. I said, I'll, I'll bet you halal crow. If I'm wrong, I'll eat halal crow on air. And they're like, we'll get that halal crow ready. Where can we find now? I'm like, you can find anything in New York. Maybe you can find me a halal crow. So now... Finally, you got, as we're recording this podcast, you had Steve Schmidt, of all people, do that thread that went viral over the weekend. I think he used the word authoritarian or perhaps fascist. You had John Dean late last night. I was awake early in the morning. This is John Dean of Watergate fame, who said, I need to find any documentaries about the rise of Hitler. What do you guys recommend? The rise of the Nazi party. You have an Applebaum and you have individuals now with what we're seeing, not just with the revelations that Trump tried to pressure his own Justice Department and saying, you know, you guys just need to say that it's rigged and I'll take care of the rest and the party will take care of the rest. You're seeing the bipartisan commission. You're seeing the response to the bipartisan commission. You're seeing Jim Jordan pretty much admit that he talked to Trump on January 6th, but all of a sudden he doesn't remember what he talked about. You see Mo Brooks, Republican senator, somehow just wearing body armor the day of January 6th. Just normal things that people do. I just, you, I, I don't know about you, Samantha, when you go teach kindergarten. I'm sure you wear some Kevlar when you just get up on the day that coincidentally happens to be a violent insurrection. And so not only are we seeing the proof now as it's dripping, but I tell people, where were you for the past five years? And where we were was, and the final thing I'll say, and thank you for coming to my TED Talk, is we were deluding ourselves that the guardrails of this thing called democracy would be enough to moderate and modulate Trumpism. And a lot of people forfeited their better judgment and were not trusting what their eyes were showing them because they were so accustomed to the way business was being run as usual. In DC, people just wanted Trump to do business as usual. This is how you scratch your back. This is how you get your back scratched. Let's like give him enough of a rope and it'll be business as usual and it'll be good for our business and we'll get on TV and we'll sell some books and don't worry about it because it didn't affect them. Trumpism didn't affect them. So they were able to delude themselves to be neutral observers as democracy was being battered in front of their faces. And so I believe we've been at DEFCON 3 for a while. I still think we're at DEFCON 3, even though Biden is president and Democrats have a 50-50 slim majority because of the what you just mentioned, this strange fidelity to the filibuster, which is an archaic construction of racists and slaveholders, really has no basis in the Constitution, contrary to what Manchin said on Jake Tapper show over the weekend. And you have Cinema, who's just like this absurdly unserious human being, and I just don't see Biden taking the threat of this rising authoritarianism as seriously as I want him to, especially as the Republicans are nakedly and openly, they're telling you their plan. It's like James Bond villain in the first act telling you exactly what he wants to do. And the rest of us are like, mm, I don't know. I think uh, bipartisanship should be the answer as they have a laser pointed to our groins. So you asked me a very simple question. I just went on a rant, but uh, that's how I feel. DEF CON 3. A rant that I think is right on point that I think a lot more people should be making those points and we'd be in a different situation if people were able to not just believe what they've seen and heard, but follow it through its logical conclusion, There you go. which is if they keep doing this, if they keep telling you who they are, if they keep showing you who they are and they say, you better believe us. And each time they up the ante, where do you think this is all going? Exactly. Yeah, what's the end game here? And if this is their end game, then is just decrying, we have norms and institutions while they are seeking to abolish those norms and institutions. Is that really a winnable game plan? No, it isn't because January 6th insurrection is not the end game. It's a sneak preview. It's what I call a rough draft. It's an exhibition game. And they will perfect it and learn from it and do it again. And if you don't believe me, a majority of Republican voters thinks disinformation and a right wing ecosystem that has radicalized, I would say about a third of our country. And when people say, well, child, why do you say 30 percent or a third of our country? Because if you see the people who consume the right wing media, it's its own self-contained ecosystem. The problem is that it bleeds into the mainstream. And the reason why that bleeds into the mainstream is that the institutions are so committed to this false notion of the view from nowhere and bipartisanship. And we have to do both sides. I I'm telling you, as a person in the media, there's so many folks who are just, they can't help it. Like they're just trained. Oh, we have to now bring the MAGA conspiracy theorists. We just have to, because God forbid, if we're seen as liberals by the people who no matter what we do, will always see us as a deep state, right? We're dealing with bad faith actors. And what usually happens, and the Democratic Party has been held hostage by this, is that the Overton window shifts to the right, the center shifts to the right, and then what's considered moderate is no longer moderate. It's like a center right. 
And the majority, the rest of us, and the people in these institutions are hijacked by the incessant whining and bad faith victimhood of individuals who crave power for the sake of power and give cruelty but always demand civility. Case in point, the entire presidency of Donald Trump, decrying cancel culture but literally canceling a free and fair election, and even Liz Cheney. Like, what more do you need to see? This is what they do to Liz Cheney, who was the number three ranking Republican who was aligned with Donald Trump's agenda 95% of the time, is a freaking Cheney and is by no means a moderate or a conservative moderate. What do you think they'll do to you? These are the Blue Lives Matter people who were fine killing a cop, and there were more than, what, 20 Republicans who refused to give those cops who saved their lives a Congressional Medal of Honor. What do you think they will do to you? And I think the January 6th violent insurrection was a wake-up call for enough people. Still not enough, but enough people like, oh my God, the United States Capitol was overrun for the first time since 1814. And five people died. And if a few police officers were not there, Mitt Romney, I don't know what would have happened to him. If they could have gotten their hands on Pelosi or even Mike Pence, they'd be dead. And this is Mike Pence, who literally has sold his soul for the rapture and Donald Trump. I feel like William Shatner in that Twilight Zone episode where he's on the plane and he's the only one who's seeing the goblin and everyone thinks he's crazy and he's trying to warn everyone. And in the end, he gets taken away in the straight jacket and the camera pans to the left and then you see like the torn airplane. Well... The difference is we're all seeing the torn airplane. Uh, Joe Manchin is like, well, in my day, bipartisanship. And you still see Biden who still thinks that they're his friends and they'll talk to him. And because we'll get this $1 trillion infrastructure package, maybe, maybe, we still haven't seen it. Maybe that somehow is a victory, even though we need probably the $6 trillion one or the $3.5 trillion one. And you have cinema, a Democrat who's saying, well, I got to cut something. And you're like, what the hell do you want to cut? Just something. Uh, but you better rush this because I got to go to vacation. And you have, meanwhile, these massive voter suppression bills that are literally taking a sledgehammer to democracy, which will endanger the democratic rule, both democratic, big D and small D, in 2022. And I just don't see the urgency. And then you gaslight yourself too, right? Like, am I crazy? Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm that crazy brown Muslim guy. Maybe I'm reaction. Maybe I spent too much time reading. And then you sit there and you go, no, no, no. I'm on to something. I'm calling it. My finger's on the button. Even conservative scholars of authoritarianism who've spent their life literally warning us about the dots and where this is going, I know I'm not crazy. Absolutely. You don't need to worry. They think that the outrage at people just continuing to normalize what no one should see as normal, I think is painful. I mean, one of the things that I most appreciate about your work is that you aren't encumbered by these rose tinted glasses or feel compelled to perpetuate myths that everything is going to be okay because America, (laughs) that the dark days have passed, we've reached a new dawn. But when you look across the larger realm of punditry, you're met with the narrative that despite all the evidence to the contrary, Trump stays in the political spotlight are numbered, his influence is waning, accountability or justice will prevail, and there's no need for alarm. Do you feel that sense? It's an interesting balance for me. I try to hardwire myself to be an optimist, but I'm a pragmatist. In order to be an optimist, I have to have faith because I have children that there are better days ahead. Otherwise, you just become a nihilistic alcoholic, right? Like it's over. But in order for those good days to arrive, there's this famous saying, uh, Muslims say this, but many cultures say this, that, uh, you know, have faith, but tie your camel first. And I don't think we're tying our camel, which means that you exercise all the effort that you can possibly muster and do what you can do with your two hands. And then you leave it to God. And I don't think we're doing that. And one thing I would ask is why do we have the filibuster? When we have bad faith actors who are in front of our face, passing the most regressive voter suppression bills that we've seen in decades with the explicit intention to limit Democratic votes so they can have minority rule in 2022 and 2024. And when you've seen a full scale assault on the U.S. Capitol to cancel a free and fair election that was not just done by MAGA protesters, let's not forget, it's the majority of Republican congressmen who voted to cancel that election, even though they knew it's bullshit. And now you see a right wing media ecosystem that I believe is the most responsible for radicalizing a third of America. I believe one of the biggest villains of America, if this book is written by the, the people who hopefully win, which is us, the people who at least care about democracy, is going to be the Murdochs. It is a self-contained right-wing ecosystem that has radicalized a third of this country. And when it comes to the voting population now, it's 50-50. And so if you just go to Barnes & Noble sometimes, you'll see like Ben Shapiro and Mark 11 books just selling like hotcakes. 
And you're like, we've lost people. And so when I see a third of this country radicalized, when I see a third of these people, which make up about a half of the electorate or a little bit less, against vaccines, pro-plague, pro-death, as 4 million people have died in a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic, when I see most of them think that Donald Trump is still the president and Biden somehow cheated, when I see the white supremacist theory that originated from America, the replacement theory being literally globalized and inspiring terrorists from New Zealand to Texas to Europe, now being marshaled by Paul Gosar, a congressman, and Marjorie Taylor Greene. And there's no checks, there's no balances. Kevin McCarthy, who is the quote unquote minority leader, you know, does a cue whistle at a rally just a couple of days ago as we're recording this podcast. And you have one of the two major political parties and the entire conservative ecosystem that is drinking this Kool-Aid knowingly doing it for ratings and for power because you know that Tucker Carlson is vaccinated. You know Murdoch's vaccinated. I know from talking to them in the CNN green room that they hate Trump, but they know where their bread is buttered. When you see people so cynically taking a sledgehammer to democracy and like you said, the truth, and it represents not a minority, but a major political party, as we are hijacked by this both sides false equivalence and these mainstream institutions where they all sit with each other and marry each other and have sex with each other and eat cheese with each other. And you're like, oh, but he's my friend. Bill Mars is bringing on the one who thinks that Santa's white and will die on that hill. Megyn Kelly. Megyn Kelly, Andrew Sullivan, Barry Weiss, Ann Coulter. That's the liberal Bill Maher. And then you sit there and think, okay, people of color, historically, they've always had to do is they have to save the country from itself. And you have to do everything in your power, not just to save your communities, but to save this thing called democracy that I don't think people realize is teetering on an edge. And the problem is that Biden's presidency gives people a sense of catharsis and relief, which was necessary. But now they think, oh, I could just kick back and let me outsource everything to the Avengers and they will come and save us. And usually when you outsource everything to one or two people, that's when authoritarianism rises. And the final thing I'll say is what troubles me is I think we have a flabby, moderate majority. I think the majority in this country is pro-democracy, pro-freedom, but they're lazy and flabby and they're kind of drinking their Kool-Aid and lemonade and they're chilling. And we're up against a very committed, zealous, organized, well-funded, counter-majoritarian minority that is playing for all the marbles. If you have given me a choice between a flabby, moderate majority and a committed, zealous, organized, well-funded, strategic minority, I'll take the minority. They'll just carve us like butter. And that's my fear. I think it's a really legitimate fear. I think it's in the same way that I have hope and I'm not full of doom constantly. I have hope that a better world is possible. I I have hope on a scientific basis, though. I know what's needed and what's creating the suffering. But I think in the same token, the doom that is taken advantage of by the fascist GOP, there's a real sense in this moment of a civil war, that this country has never been as divided as it is now since the Civil War, and in some ways, it's even in a worse position now, because those who are the most out of touch with reality, those who have the most confidence in their cause, are those who seek to annihilate whole peoples. And they're the ones that are not just gunned up, but they're the ones that are the most organized and recognize the division and the crisis that exists. And I think that to me, a big part of the problem is that soft middle's reliance on proxies in power to stop this, that those institutions and those who they elect are going to be the guardrails to this crisis. And I think that what we've seen over the past five years is that the Democratic Party without a situation that that really shakes things up. I think we've seen that they will not oppose this fascism the way that it needs to be opposed. And I think that the point that I was making with the media is that I think that that they play a tremendous role in pacifying, in my opinion, that soft middle, if you will. Absolutely. What we're witnessing basically is the death rattle of white supremacy that has turned into a death march, in my opinion, both here and abroad. They're playing for all the marbles and it's a zero-sum game. And when I used to say this, people used to get really offended. I said this tweet and I gave this analogy that has been used before by others. And of course, this is a metaphor and figurative language, but you can't do that sometimes with Fox News. I said, if given a choice between renting a room to a person of color or burning down the house, they will choose to burn down the village. They will die for whiteness. And people said, you're crazy. And then January 6th happened. And when he's mentioned civil war, Paul Gosar allegedly said that we're in the midst of a civil war to the Oath Keepers leader in Arizona. Oath Keeper being, the, I would say, a white supremacist militia group where many members were involved in the January 6th uh, insurrection. And what people don't realize is they are playing for all the marbles. 
Look, it's easy to think that people have horns on their head and they're evil. These are most likely average Americans who are living their life, but they have been radicalized to believe that there is a deep state conspiracy that is attacking their fundamental way of life, their culture, their values, their whiteness. They're coming after their children's sexuality and their pronouns now. All is lost. And the only way that you can reclaim your values, your culture, your narrative against this overwhelmingly hostile force that is conspiratorial and wicked and runs a sex trafficking operation and eats children is to rise up and raise your guns, which is a perfect base for an authoritarian to manipulate. Voila Donald Trump. And Donald Trump then, he's their avatar. He's their id. He is their shining white rage who's willing to fight for them and fight their enemies. So they'll make any rationalization. That explains white evangelical Christians. They know he's a Philanderer, he's a Bulgarian, he has a carnal appetite, but like it doesn't matter. They call him Cyrus, the pagan Persian king who God nonetheless used as an instrument for something better. So he's our Cyrus. That's the analogy that's been given by white evangelical leaders. And once you have about a third of this country radicalized in the midst of income inequality and climate change and racism and violence and uncertainty and economic collapse, they grasp onto something that gives them meaning and identity and purpose. And voila, Trumpism is that purpose of what Trump allegedly represents. And the voters for Trump, and we said this and no one believed us, and by saying us, especially journalists of color and our colleagues, many white folks dismissed us. I write about this briefly in the book, why they dismissed us. It's because once you're in privilege, you're blind to privilege and the abuses of that privilege. And also you can afford to be a spectator to the chaos. You can afford to be a zoologist and looking at it with a detachment. The rest of us couldn't afford it. We had to do our work, report, comment, and like I said, resist because this is coming after our wives and our children and our communities. But when you're white and you're in power or you're wealthy, then you're like, ah, oh, business as usual. I'll sell some books. I'll get some ratings. The guardrails of which I am part of will withstand this. They're my friends. They're not that bad. And even now you're seeing them saying, well, Trump was really good for ratings. You saw Les Moonves openly admit this, the former head of CBS who then had to resign due to numerous sexual assault allegations. You can Google this right now. He's Les Moonves said, you know, Trump might be bad for America, but he's really good for CBS. And you saw Zucker say that on CNN. And so ultimately what it comes down to is we need journalists in particular and those institutionalists, even like Robert Mueller, we needed them to be more biased in favor of democracy. Even now, it is okay for you to be a journalist and say, I'm biased for democracy against fascism. I'm not going to both sides fascism. I'm not going to both sides genocide. I'm not going to both sides authoritarianism. I'm going to be for democracy and for the truth. And as such, I am not going to do a both sides false equivalence like Chuck Todd and give my platform to a bad faith actor who will use it to now take these lies that originate from the right wing infrastructure and pollute and contaminate the moderate flabby majority. And I think slowly we're learning that right now, but it's still too slow. That's my problem. It's still sl too slow, Samantha. I think we're running out of time. And I wish, going back to your previous comment and question, there was a sense of urgency because we don't have that much time left. And we're still talking about infrastructure. And God knows if we're going to get it. I really appreciate what you were saying, especially about what difference it would have made had, let's say, all the editorial boards for major newspapers in this country come out and said, at the time of the Muslim ban or kids in cages, we won't accept a fascist America mm. and we demand Trump's immediate removal. That would have made a tremendous difference, in my opinion. So I think that it's worth considering not just to rehash the past for the sense of being like, we were right, they were wrong, but also because... The past isn't past yet, so what are yeah. we going to do? And the past isn't past to the point where white rage is still hijacks this country. Like, look what's happening with CRT. Exactly. Yeah, the past is not over. And people think, oh, we voted for Obama once, we live in a post-racial society, and the rest of us are like, mm, you just wait. And in a strange way, this is my absurd optimist coming out with some dark humor. Trump's overt bigotry that has been embraced by the conservative movement and many others at least validates the concerns and fears and warnings of so many Americans that were belittled or ignored. I'll give you an example just from the Muslim perspective. Post 9-11, especially with the rise of anti-Muslim bigotry, people are like, ah, you Muslims, you're always whining and complaining. Everything's fine. Relax. And then Trump comes in with a Muslim ban. And I had a lot of liberal friends saying, oh, huh, you, 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 you guys weren't just saying that. And, you know, black people forever have been saying it. And so in a strange way, it's forcing people to stop being neutral. You have to pick a side. And when people say, oh, you know, how come folks didn't, you know, refuse Trump's fascism? I want to tell them that 11 million more people after Trump's first term are like, we want this guy. Right, right. This is the guy for us. And right. so this speaks deep to what's exists in America. This is the death rattle of white supremacy. And this is the fight 
for power and control of this country. And this is also disinformation and fear and greed. I'll tell you, like some people of color, some Asian, South Asian were like, Trump's good for my bottom line. That's it. Or they chased whiteness. You know, like, oh, well, you know, uh, these blacks and these Mexicans, you know, they're always so lazy. And look at this crime eh. or disinformation. Some people are like, both sides are messed up. I, Biden's old. I don't know. And so it's easy to simply sit there and go, oh, it's just a MAGA hat wearing folks. But enough people in the middle get converted thanks to disinformation, thanks to propaganda, thanks to losing faith in institution, which is why I think it puts the onus on reporters and journalists even more to be on the side of democracy and against fascism openly. And they're like, oh, what about both sides? Like, let me put it this way real quick. Where is the right wing going to go if you shut them out? They got Newsmax, they got One American News Network, they got the podcast, they got Fox News. All right, great. You're reaching only 35%. That's why when it's ABC, CBS, like they need them to win over enough of the independents, right? What happens if you just like seal them out? Say, I'm going to seal you out unless you literally affirm Biden as president. Don't lie. Don't spread conspiracy theories. You're a kindergarten teacher. If you behave, you can join the rest of the class. If not, you stay in the corner. It's going to hurt them. They don't need them, but we don't have it because we have both sides journalism and it's a big club and we're not part of it. I want to segue into something that you touched on in terms of talking. You made a post 9-11 comment and your friends who didn't see certain things that then saw certain things. It's true that Donald Trump did not start any wars, but it's hard to start new wars when you inherit a military bombing and murdering people all around the globe. And I was wondering if you could speak about how W and Obama's war on terror helped set the stage and ushered in, if you will, the rise of American fascism. Yeah. So the war on terror has been nurtured and supported. It's one of the few bipartisan things left in America, right? By both Republicans and Democrats. Now, that being said, I'm old enough to live through the Bush administration. And yes, Bush was far worse than Obama or Trump or Biden when it came to our foreign policy. But at the same time, what we warned back in the day was as Muslims and people of color and those who were Muslim, we said, fine, you guys are going against us. We're the bad guys. And you guys are willing to trade your liberties for the false feeling of security. And you're willing to villainize us. But what are you unleashing? You're unleashing a ecosystem that will be hard to contain. You are strengthening a beast that will turn on you eventually. You are creating this vast apparatus that allows for surveillance, not just on Muslims, which you guys were perfectly fine with, but eventually it'll turn on you. And you're allowing extra judicial killings. Yeah, you're fine because it's Anwar Oluki's son and him right now. And, you know, uh, Anwar Oluki was a, a mouthpiece for Al-Qaeda. His son was just an innocent teenager. And you guys are fine with it because, eh, Muslims in the Middle East and Yemen, who cares? But what happens if it turns on you? And that's what happens is we'd rather be safe than be free. And lo and behold, you see the long arm of the war on terror where the world is now a battleground. We have our local police looking like they belong from like Call of Duty, to walk in the streets, treating fellow Americans like we're insurgents. You saw this in 2020, in the summer, when millions came out to protest the murder of George Floyd. Look at the police state that came out to greet peaceful protesters. And I'm talking about white people in Portland. You guys remember that? White folks, white moms. So I'm like, they're turning on white moms. They're turning on old white grandfathers with a walker in Utah. Remember that guy who got pushed? And so this is what happens when you let power go unchecked, is that you get very close to achieving a police state. And I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican, why would you relinquish power voluntarily? If I have the ability to use this entire apparatus to achieve my goals, both domestically and when it comes to foreign policy, why would I neuter myself? And you saw Trump exercise that. I'll give you one example. When they quote unquote cleared peaceful protesters in front of the White House so Trump could walk with generals to the church to take a photo op where he held the Bible upside down. Congratulations. The war on terror is at home. Folks like Eric Prince, who is the brother of Beth DeVos, hard right fanatical anti-Muslim Christians with a type of like end game apocalyptic zealotry, who is literally like saying, hey, hey, everybody, I made my money off the war on terror. I'm willing now to outsource this to any authoritarian regime. I'll work with China. I'll work with the Middle East. Trump, what do you want from me? And so the chickens come home to roost. I hate to say that. And voila, what we enabled and empowered and allowed due to our zealous rage against, quote unquote, Islam and Muslims who are the enemy has now come home against the real Americans, which, of course, always means white folks in the suburb. Let's not sit there and keep the timeline just at the war on terror. It was the war on drugs. War on drugs. Nancy Reagan, Ronald Reagan. Let's clean up the streets. You got tanks in the, quote unquote, inner city, in the ghettos. And when it comes to the opioid crisis and meth affecting white folks, well, then they need our help. 
But uh, once you're introducing tanks in American streets for the quote unquote war on drugs, where quote unquote the enemy is oftentimes people of color, that was the precursor to the war on terror. And the war on terror now is going to be the precursor to the war against the deep state. And wait until the Republicans get back in power. What makes you think that they will practice moderation? And also Democrats. What makes you think Democrats and Obama will practice moderation? I'll give you an example of Obama, the you know, extrajudicial killing of Anwar Oluki. You can hate Oluki, but the manner in which it was done is terrifying. Drone strikes, threatening the sovereignty of another country, just raining death from the sky, not really caring about the trauma that this inflicts upon people. You know, I've talked to folks from Yemen, and they'll, just, they'll tell you. It's like this worrying. You look up in the sky, and you just hear this sound. You're like, death could come at any moment the quote unquote collateral damage. And what does that say about us? And what does that say about power? And what does that say about humanity that you're perfectly willing from a base somewhere in Arizona with someone on a joystick to rain death on another country? But it's a democratic president, so it's okay. So anyway, you asked me a simple question. I gave you my thoughts. And I really appreciate them. And I think that this has always been true for this country since its founding, that the exceptionalism that exists that destroys people's ability to care about lives that are other than American. But I think it's an important reminder that what we've allowed and what we've forgotten, I think, is also important to remember and question why we've forgotten it and why it doesn't even produce outrage in people the way that it should. We're we're hitting the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. And oftentimes it's easier to look back with nostalgia and romanticism and not realize that this country went mad for a couple of years. I always use one example. In 2003, Dixie Chicks, were now known as the Chicks, were like the biggest band in America. They had this this amazing tour that sold like so many tickets worldwide. And Natalie Maines, who's the lead singer of the Chicks, all she said was, if I remember correctly, it almost might be the same exact quote. I'm embarrassed that George W. Bush is from Texas. Bye, y'all. That's all she said. And for those of you who are young, there was a thing called CDs back in the day. And this country went so crazy, they took tractors over their CDs. They burned their CDs. And overnight, just like Liz Cheney, Dixie Chicks were like the most harmless white women on earth. You know, like these these bubblegum, catchy songs that crossed over from country to mainstream. Like everyone loved the Dixie Chicks. They were public enemy number one. That's how crazy this country was, right? We we're perfectly fine surveilling innocent Muslims in New York. We're perfectly fine with these really malicious prosecutions and shutting down charities, mosque crawlers, and community rakers. And we were okay with it because the enemy at the time was them. Whoever doesn't look like us, Muslims, Arabs, anybody. And when we only seem to care is that when it affects us. Same thing with the pandemic. You saw this a year and a half ago. Some people openly said, well, it's only affecting a certain demographic. That meant black people and poor people. Once it started affecting them, now they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's get these masks up. It's like Macbeth. You're not trying to see the blood on your hands, but eventually you have to see it. There's a lot of blood on our hands as America, like these two disastrous wars. And what happens? America's really good at war. It's not good at empire building. And what happened? Biden's like, all right, let me just wash my hands, leave Afghanistan. And lo and behold, Taliban. Yesterday, Washington Post, like what we've been fearing, Taliban's making their assault. And so what did we accomplish? What did we accomplish at the end of the day, except death and destruction and traumatizing generations in Iraq and Afghanistan? And not to mention also our soldiers, those who came back traumatized. That's also the legacy, I think, of the war on terror, in addition to the rise of the quote unquote post 9-11 police state. I do encourage listeners to think about when we talk about the actions of the U.S. government and we talk about wars that they wage and things like that, to notice the difference that you are not the same as your government and your government can commit incredible atrocities, but you are not the government. And that does not mean that you aren't responsible for what your government does in your name. I don't know about you, Samantha, but I remember like, you know, the people knew what was up. The people around the world knew that that war would be a disaster. We took to the streets of those of you guys who remember. I mean, hundreds of thousands of us. I was a college student. We took to the streets preemptively at UC Berkeley, knowing that there was a war coming before it was announced. So it was one of those situations where you kind of realize the strength of grassroots activism and also the limitations. There's an ecosystem of resistance that's needed an inside and outside push and pull. Going back to the start of this conversation, you need those people with those privileged platforms to do a little bit more. You yeah. just can't sit there on the laurels and believe, ah, oh, the guardrails, like you said, will save us because the guardrails did save us, but barely. So let's turn to COVID for a moment, the effects of which 
the actions of the Trump Pence regime, in, in my opinion, at this point, can only be called genocidal. Mm. Their actions. You framed Trump's latest declaration, I thought, really powerfully in your latest piece. You said, quote, many members of America's death cult are simply following the self emolulating steps of their infantile God King, Donald Trump. Despite surviving COVID-19, thanks to the best doctors and medicine in the world, Trump responded to the CDC's new mask wearing guidance with an angry call. Don't surrender to COVID. Don't go back. End quote. And it struck me how similar it was to W telling us back in the early 2000s that if we stop shopping, then the terrorists win. Yeah, that was the next day. There's big differences and I don't want to blunt them. But I think what's most striking is how they've been training their base to put on these blinders and it works more each time to the extent they're almost literally self emolliating dousing themselves and anyone around them in COVID and then lighting the match, using their bodies to fuel the flames of this willful ignorance. And I was wondering if you saw any connections. Yeah, yeah it's, yeah. it's self-immolation for the sake of whiteness, dying for power. It's the cults, like, you know, the Kool-Aid that they say, the Jim Jones analogy that is often used for the last couple of years. But look, what really infuriates me is that people like Trump and those in power don't have the courage of their convictions because this mother effort is vaccinated. Tucker's vaccinated. Rupert Murdoch's vaccinated. And so they are perfectly fine to radicalize their base and have their base die for their profits and their power. And the base is perfectly fine willing to do that for their God King, who is their raging avatar of frustration, of pain. And they believe that they're dying for, quote unquote, their freedoms. No, but they're just dying. And that's what happens when you radicalize folks and rally them around an authoritarian leader. The authoritarian leader says, I am your soul's redeemer. I am your only defender. Have faith in me. If I succeed, you succeed. The state is me. Everything is me. And so you need to do what I tell you to do. And you need to fight for me because if you're fighting for me, you're fighting for yourself because I'm fighting for you. Gaddafi did this. Saddam Hussein did this. Right. Hitler did this. Mussolini did this. What's the difference with Trump? It's the man who literally got access to the best health care on earth coughing his lungs out, getting COVID, had to be friggin' taken on the plane. And then after getting life-saving medicine, he takes off his mask and coughs in the White House and probably kills like five other people. Right? Like This is a pro-death, pro-plague, nihilistic cult that is in service of selfish people who don't even care about the folks that are dying. To them. That's the worst part. Tucker Carlson lives right here in D.C. in a multi-million dollar house with other quote-unquote elites. He's a blue blood, bow-tied, soft-handed person who's the heir of like a fish stick magnet. This guy has never tasted any hardship, but they know that if they can feed this base rage and fear and hysteria, well, it fills their bottom line. And I think this is the tragedy, is that Tucker will be fine, Trump will be fine, but the people who will be doing the dying is this base of otherwise average Americans who just got radicalized. And now we're hearing headline after headline saying, I wish I took the vaccine. Ugh. I texted my wife, take the vaccine. Ugh. And, you know, I get no joy reading this, but I'm like, at the same time, you're like, it's been a year and a half and you chose death. And it goes back to Jonathan Metzl's book, Dying for Whiteness. It's going to be more of that. It's going to be more of that. That's what people don't realize. I've said this before and people think I'm crazy. This is a zero sum absolutist game for them. It is the death march of whiteness. They're going to burn it all down, including themselves. And I said this before the pandemic, and the pandemic is revealing it, that they will literally die instead of doing the right thing. Before we go, can you tell us a little bit about your forthcoming book? Was there anything in particular that inspired you to write it now? Yeah. So the book is called Go Back to Where You Came From and other helpful recommendations on how to become American. I've, I've been trying to write a book for a while and I felt like something during the pandemic, the birth of my third kid, right before the election, I felt there was a sense of urgency. And it's very much in tune with this conversation we've had that I don't shy away from the horrors and chaos of what we're facing. But the book, I believe, will be unexpectedly hopeful for many people. And I do a Trojan horse where it's a memoir, but a self-help guide. So it's a juxtaposition of satire and humor to pain, humor to heartbreak, which I think is the juxtaposition of the American narrative that there's the American dream, but there's also the American nightmare. There's the hope, but there's pain and racism. And I felt like I was able to marry that and perhaps reflect that in the title, where I'm told almost every day, go back to where you came from. And I'm like, oh, thank you for that helpful recommendation. Will you pay for my rent in the Bay Area, California? And it's so with that tone that I try to booby trap some of these stereotypes. I try to inform, I hopefully entertain, educate, and add some of the narratives that have been missing from the American story and maybe add some of the co-protagonists who have been missing. So that's the hope. That's the intention. The book coming out in January. I hope you guys like it. Let me know what you think. 
I'm really looking forward to reading it. And I want to thank you again for joining us and sharing your refreshing perspective and expertise with us and a link to the upcoming book along with a link to Wajat's Daily Beast articles is going to be in the show notes. So be sure to check that. Woohoo! That was Sam Goldman speaking with Wajahat Ali. Instead of dismissing those who have been sounding the alarm on this fascist threat for the past five years, or deluding ourselves that fascism can't happen here, or that the normal channels will lead us out of this nightmare, while the center keeps shifting further to the right towards all-out fascism, It is critical to understand this 21st century American fascism and bring into reality the spirit of the slogan, In the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. For more on the Republic fascist strategy of the big lie overturning elections and what they learn from other fascists like Viktor Orban, check out the May 30th episode, which features Sam's interview with Walden Bellow. And check out the interview with Federico Finkelstein from the March 7th episode. You can also watch Andy Z's talk at Revolution Books on episode 64 of the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show on YouTube at the Revcoms. Thanks for listening to the Refuse Fascism podcast. If you want to help the show, it's simple. You can rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your listening platform of choice. And of course, subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can chip in to support the show by clicking the donate button at refusefascism.org or Venmo refuse-fascism. On Cash App, it's refusefascism, all one word. And be sure to let us know that you're donating after hearing this podcast. As always, we want to hear from you. Share your comments, ideas, questions, suggestions of topics or guests, or lend a skill. You can tweet me at Coco underscore Das, or you can tweet at Sam B. Goldman, or drop Sam an email, Samantha Goldman at RefuseFascism.org. Leave a voicemail by calling 917-426-7582. You can also record a voice message by going to anchor.fm slash RefuseFascism. You might even hear yourself on a future episode. Thanks, as always, to Lena Thorne and Richie Marini for helping produce the show. Did you know that transcripts of each episode are made available thanks to volunteers? Check them out at refusefascism.org. Refuse Fascism.